I'm Denise. She's a non-fiction editor. And I'm Louise. She's a fiction editor. And together, we're the Editing Podcast. Hello again, and welcome to another episode of the Editing Podcast. So this time around, we're going to take a look at five different character roles, and specifically the language many fiction editors and authors use to describe them. Yeah, and we decided to do this because from an editor's point of view, having an understanding of the lingo means you've got a story you can tell an author, a sort of hierarchical framework you can consider when you're assessing how well a novel is working. So, Louise, is this something that falls into developmental or structural editing, you know, like the big picture stuff? Yeah, it, it is. But I think it's it's one of those things that it's worth all fiction editors knowing about, like that terminology, because mm. a writer might already be fluent with these terms and comfortable using them. And, and that means we need to be able to respond to, to, to those people with confidence. But then again, some beginner and emerging writers might not be so clear about these roles and the purpose of them and, and the terminology used in the publishing industry. And so if the editor makes sure they know this, then at least they're able to um, to explain it, even if that conversation ends up with the line editor or copy editor saying, if you want guidance on how to de- better develop this particular type of character role, I think you should work with and then recommend something. Yeah, yeah. Well, that makes sense. It's that old chestnut of, you know, knowing what you don't know so, so yeah, that yeah. you can give good advice and appropriate support. Um, so I'm assuming that I'm going to be way out of my depth here being a non-fiction editor. So I'll just let you lead on this. <laughs> you know what? I don't <laughs> think so. I suspect most of those five terms we cover today will be things you've heard of. And even if there are a couple you haven't heard of, as soon as we chat about what they are, I'm pretty sure you'll be able to think of an example that you've seen on TV or at the cinema or read in a book. If you say so, harm babe. Okay, let's crack on. (laughs) Off you go. (laughs) Okay, so first up is the protagonist. Oh, excellent. You're right. I'm familiar with that term. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. So the protagonist is one of two central or main characters who's right at the top of the hierarchy in terms of importance. The other one is the antagonist. Oh, and I know that one. I know what that is too. So thanks for listening to the editing podcast this week. (laughs) No, um, seriously, carry on. (laughs) So it's the protagonist and antagonist goals, successes and obstacles that drive a story forward. Without either of those roles, there's no story and there's no plot. And so much of the time, we'll experience the story from the, their perspective. And I would describe the the, prota- the protagonist as the one we're meant to invest in, the star of the show. So the hero, right? Well, sort of. So think about some of the books you've read or the shows you've watched. Sometimes protagonists aren't saintly heroes, especially in the kinds of books that I edit, hard-boiled mm. crime and noir, for example. Sometimes they're intriguing, villainous anti-heroes. Ah, so just because someone's doing bad things, they can still be a protagonist. Yeah, definitely. As long as they're the character we're supposed to be invested in. Oh, I know, I know, I know. Like Dexter. <laughs> Dexter. Exactly like Dexter. Yeah. So he's a psychopathic serial killer and anti-hero, but we care about him and we want him to succeed in life. We want him not to be caught. I know, we really like him, don't we? Yeah, and we it's, do. It's, it's, it's a bit of a weird experience being yeah. a reader or a viewer when you find yourself actually rooting for someone like that. <laughs> I mean, it's weird. There's definitely a feeling of sort of discomfort or, or even like guilt. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, in that case, would another example from TV be Walter White from Breaking Bad? Yes. Yes. Yeah. He's always the protagonist, but shifts from hero to anti hero as his character develops. And another example in literature is Patrick Bateman in American Psycho. Uh... He's an awful, superficial, narcissistic sociopath. And mm. while I wouldn't say I was exactly rooting for him <laughs> um, when I read that book in the same way that I, I, I root for Dexter, he's still the protagonist. Yeah, yeah, that's that's an interesting way of looking at it, yeah. So how about antagonists? They antagonise. So I'm assuming they're the people who try to thwart the protagonist, yeah? Yeah, exactly right. So antagonists put obstacles and challenges in the way of the protagonist. And now you're going to tell me that if a protagonist can be a murderer, then an antagonist isn't necessarily a criminal or a villain. 
Yeah. Right, again. <laughs> Sometimes antagonists are flawed heroes, bent coppers, corrupt agents and dirty judges, but they could also be a good copper agent or judge. The point isn't really whether they're goodies or baddies or somewhere in between, but what the, their role in the novel is. So if they're there, as you said, to thwart the protagonist from achieving their goals, then they're an antagonist. Right. <clears throat> so in Breaking Bad, who would you say the antagonist is? I'd say it shifts in that show. So at first mm -hmm. it's a drug dealer, a more traditional baddie style antagonist. Mm, and then there's Gustavo, Frank, the fast food guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's like a traditional antagonist, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, again, yeah. he is. Um, but then think about Hank, Walter's brother-in-law. He's also an antagonist because he's a dedicated FBI agent who threatens to uncover Walter's secret identity. So that's a good example of a character doing the right thing, but their purpose in the story is still essentially one of an, of an antagonist. Oh, do you know, that's so true because I really loved Hank. <laughs> he yeah. was great. But he, it was a, a sort of an ambivalence in, like, because I, I didn't want Walter to get caught either, you know. So it's, yeah, yeah. You know, so it was, it was a strange sort of um You're tall, aren't you? Yeah. Yes, yeah. And that's yeah. a thing you can. You can, you can, you can, you know, good writers can really... Can they can pull you both ways? Mm. Okay, Harmby, here's a question. Can a character be both a protagonist and an antagonist? Yeah, they can. And mm. the language we use to describe them is anti-protagonist. Oh, of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> and that happens in a novel. That's not the fifth. That's not one of our five, by the way. That's a bonus extra. Oh, right. Um, that happens in a novel where there's a single character driving the story forward. So when that happens, the character is their own worst enemy. It's their own actions that create opposition and conflict, often within themselves or against their own goals. So, well, if we carry on talking about Breaking Bad, isn't that then what Walter White kind of becomes? Yes, yeah, I'd say you're yeah. right about that. And that's mm -hmm. the thing about fictional worlds and the character types that inhabit them. Um, it's it's usually not straightforward, like in a Marvel comic or a fairy mm -hmm. tale. Characters' roles can change and blur. And that's what makes it interesting. And with Walter White, you know, as, as, as we were talking about the top... Um, he starts off as uh, as this as this hero who's 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 just trying to solve problems, mm -hmm. but then he starts making decisions as you go throughout the series that yeah. are uh, uh, he he is he literally becomes his own enemy. I mean, yeah. he's got other enemies. There are other antagonists, but um, he he's definitely playing that role of 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 his own antagonist while yeah. being the protagonist at the same time <laughs> just like i mean it's like people people are complicated aren't they so yeah. you know you yeah. don't necessarily all fit into one single box yeah yeah but just to be clear protagonists and antagonists regardless of their behaviors they're still the most important characters in the novel yeah yeah, they're, they're top of the tree because they drive the story and the plot and it's them that writers need to keep their focus on. If their experience, experiences start to get lost in a novel, the book will lose its way. Mm, that makes sense, yeah. Okay, so what's next down in that hierarchy then? So next is the Deuter Agonist. The Deuter what now? <laughs> it's Greek, <laughs> meaning <course>. second actor. <laughs> I had to, just to say, I had to look that up. <laughs> I didn't know that. Right. So, presumably then, it is what it says in the tin. It's the second most important character. Yeah, and they tend to operate alongside the protagonist. So it's usually a sidekick or a confidant. And I'd, I'd say that they're the characters who tend to have the most influence on the protagonist. So they often help that primary character to solve problems and overcome their obstacles. So continuing with Breaking Bad, that would be Jesse Pinkman, right? <laughs> I love that. Breaking Bad. <laughs> the, the, so do I. <laughs> the irony that, that actually we're talking about sort of novel editing and yet we've just focused on, I'm sure there is a book version of the show. Yeah. Yeah, probably. So, but but Jesse Pinkman's perfect example. Um, mm -hmm. Doctor Watson in the Sherlock Holmes novels is is another deuteragonist, or Samwise Gam Gamgee from the Lord of the Rings. So these okay. characters' support of and interactions with the protagonist can add real emotional depth and complexity to characterization and story. But they're also really brilliant when writers want a mechanism through which they can hold the protagonist accountable by questioning their beliefs and behaviours. Right, so acting as some sort of like moral counterpoint. Yeah, 
Yeah, well, that's interesting. I didn't know that term, but now that we've chatted about the role of the deuter agonist, I think I'm going to start seeing them everywhere. You're Especially... also going to start using that word, aren't you? So I am. I'm going to sound really <laughs> up myself. Um, but yeah, I think particularly when I'm reading books or watching films or shows, like you said, that aren't following that sort of traditional hero narrative where all the protagonists are perfect saints and all the villains are all somehow innately evil. Yeah, and it and it makes for much more realistic. You were talking about this just a little while ago. It makes for much more realistic and interesting fiction because it gives writers opportunities to explore the complexity of being a sentient emotional creature and consider more deeply why people are behaving in a transgressive way, um, uh, for example, rather than just labelling them as bad mm. um or, or or why people are, are, are behaving in a good way um that deuteragonist is doing that job of of, of sort of forcing the the, the reader or, or or provide providing a mechanism for the reader to um be able to explore that and mm. and sometimes it can look at how people behave sometimes behave appallingly because of the monstrous situations they face as a result of society's norms and values mm. or, or as a result of trauma yeah, exactly. Mm. Deuteragonists uh, can be really powerful tools for that. Asking questions and expressing concerns and challenging the character they're working alongside to bring those issues to the fore. Mm, very interesting. Yeah. So is there anything else? I mean, it feels like we've focused on sort of three biggies here. Yeah. So editors might also come across the term tritagonist. Never heard of one of those either. <laughs> the word sort of gives it away. I'm assuming more Greek. And yeah. therefore, the third most important character? From tr from Tritos, apparently. Of course. I looked that up too. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, you nailed it. So these characters are also really important and central to the story and may well feature as often as a deuteragonist, but they're not so influential in terms of their impact on the plot. So, for example, they might provide regular emotional support or physical backup, but they tend to slide along with the story or support it rather than determining along with the protagonist uh, and the antagonist how it develops. Okay, so I'm thinking about slow horses. Not so Breaking they're... Bad. No, I've moved on from Breaking Bad. <laughs> I moved so on to my other Breaking Bad. <laughs> I'm done with Breaking. Done with Walter. I'm on to Jackson Lamb now. So slow horses, TV show, but also books which we've both mm. read. Um, so Jackson Lamb is the protagonist, he is. and River Cartwright would be the deuteragonist. So. And the tritagonists would be characters like Catherine Standish, Louisa, Louisa Guy and Roddy Ho. Right. They're key to enabling critical, critical things to happen um, and they slide along with, with that. But it's Lamb and Cartwright whose actions and interactions tend to drive the plot along mm -hmm. with various antagonists, including terrorists and various bad faith actors within MI5. Like Spider. Yes, yes. Like, spider. <laughs> like spider. So, well, they're still pretty important then, even though they're sort of third actors. It sounds like they're they're more than just passing through. Yeah, yeah. So, Definitely. okay. So, what do we call those characters who play an even more minor role in the story? So, there are characters obviously who populate the world of a story and give it realism and depth, but who shouldn't significantly impact on or influence the plot or the development of the other characters. And they're usually called tertiary characters. Well, I'm disappointed that they're not some kind of agonist here. There was a theme <laughs> going, going on. So are they just like background noise, so to speak? Um, They might flit in and out, but they should still have a function. Otherwise, they're just a waste of space. They're just filler. So maybe they appear fleetingly, but provide a key piece of information. Or perhaps they'll do or say something that highlights certain traits or aspects of the protagonist. Or that triggers the protagonist or the deuteragonist to come up with a little light bulb moment. Right. So sort of providing a bit more depth to a character by their interactions, that sort of thing, yep. or yep. contrast of sorts. Yeah, definitely. Um, and we wouldn't, but we wouldn't expect them to be getting whole scenes dedicated to exploring their particular viewpoint or emotional turmoil. Okay. I think that's one of the key things. That's, that's, they're there, but they're, then mm -hmm. again, we're not, we're not sort of getting into their heads. Okay. That's interesting. So thinking about that, do you sometimes find that authors who are developing their craft um, can sometimes slip into maybe trying to give too much space to these minor characters 
because they're trying to make the novel feel more real mm. so it's maybe going too much into exploring their feelings and the impact a situation has on them yeah I think that that does definitely happen now and then and I think you're exactly right about why that happens as well um it's that it's that desperate need to make sure that the reader understands that you know this mm -hmm. is this is what happens in real life but it can end up with a situation where readers have too many heads to explore so just for example even if a barista is is distressed about the attack they witnessed in their cafe that can be dealt with within a line readers don't need a whole chapter dedicated to their trauma instead the trauma of the incident the incident could be explored through the protagonist and and the deuteragonist for example and perhaps they could reference the effect on the barista but the the focus is still around the sent those central characters not the person making the coffee does that make right sense? right so they're not agonists, so they shouldn't be agonizing. Precisely. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I can see how, actually, I can see how for a beginner writer, understanding the job of each of those character roles, can, it can help them keep focused and on track and stop them devoting too much time to delving into things that don't drive the story forward. You know, so making sure they're writing about the right character's experiences. Definitely which is what it's all about for writers and the mm. editors who support them. It's about ensuring that the book works and that it flows well and that the most important characters get most of the space because that way the reader doesn't get bogged down in managing everyone's experiences. Every word sound counts. Every scene counts. And the light gets shined on the stars of the show. Precisely. Beautifully wrapped <laughs> up, Cal. Very well done. Thank you. And you. <laughs> <laughs> So that's it from us. Thank you once again for listening. Hope you enjoyed that. If you'd like to help us, um, if you'd like to help support the editing podcast, we've got a couple of options for you. The first is that you can tip us with a one-off donation of your choosing. Or you can join our Patreon community. All our patrons get exclusive access to a huge batch of transcripts. And both the links are in the show notes. In the meantime, she's been Denise. And she's been Louise. Join us again next time. Bye. Bye.